by way of introduction, uh, we have Nancy Budway, who is a woman who needs no further introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There is a, a biography in the book, and one thing is that I'm a developmental psychologist and a learning scientist, and a lot of my work has taken place in the area of informal learning, and a few of you heard me many years ago give a talk on how children learn something really, really complicated, like language. They look like they learn it effortlessly. Do any of you have kids like who went through that zero to three age where they move? So I've given talks on that, and this time I decided not to talk on that safe topic, which I could do in my sleep. And I'm going to talk to you about a new topic, something actually that was inspired over the last eight years by this conference, by this workshop. I sit in the back row, you sometimes see me taking notes, and I'm, I'm really getting inside the heads of what it's like to be a high school student, what it's like to be a high school teacher of psychology. And I'm thinking about how does that compare to the cohort that might just six months later take that same course? And it reminds me of my studies of children learning language in lots of different cultures. They're almost the same, but different. And I want to play around with a kind of provocative set of questions today about that. At the same time, then I'm going to be talking about some new work in the learning sciences about how people learn, in particular how young people learn, okay? So last night I went home from the very hot room of Tilton Hall where there was no air conditioning, or very limited in my opinion, and I had had an active learning photo that came from the way we teach off in psychology in the research labs. And I figured, you're going to see that today. So I thought just to begin with a chill, um, this is from another faculty member who teaches in the geoscience area. And uh, these are some of the Clark students and faculty members. They actually go to the Arctic and do research. And that's one thing that happens in college settings. You're actually involved often in the actual doing. And in high school, you're involved in the doing. The question is, is that doing the same thing? And what would learning science have to say about those common ways we try and get students to learn? OK, so what I want to do today is just talk about what is learning. And I want to, in particular, after we get into some of the things that are in your textbook about learning, which you all could recite better than me, talk about this new interdisciplinary growing field of the learning sciences. And I'll go through several different ways they would approach this question. And then if we have time, I have a little exercise. We may do the exercise collectively. Some com concluding comments, and I'm going to save some time at the end for discussion and question. OK, so what is learning when I approach this? I want to just start with some opening comments. And the way I'm just going to jump right into this for the sake of time is you know that I asked you some questions. Right? And I want to think about some of the answers that I got to those questions. Then I want to look a little bit historically just for a couple minutes on how various people have begun to answer that. And then I want to start thinking about the kind of learning we're all passionate about, very concrete with our students. OK, so let me just jump right into the historical, well, I think maybe some of you viewed that really quickly. Let's check the subliminal. But if I were to ask you from how you teach learning, what are some of the views of learning you guys teach? What's learning when you're teaching it? Go ahead, Emily. It's a relatively permanent change in behavior. <laughs> what do people think? If we had clickers here, sometimes in colleges you use clickers, I think everybody would agree she had some core things. So what kind of theories of learning do you guys touch on? Yeah, jump well, in. I, mean, I, I think the old school one, you start with behaviorism, and then you move to Piaget and cognitive. But I actually think it's related to what the professor was lecturing on yesterday. It's almost that I, I think the science is now moving to learning is actually more of the critical thinking. Right. Now. Good. Well, that was like a... A, a really nice segue, look at this, like almost <laughs> word for word. If you take the three, if, if I were to ask you, um, and we might have done something with Clicker today, but I'm going to be using some YouTube videos because I figured more of you would have access to YouTube videos and give you some that I've used than um, Clickers, which you may or may not 
have in your school. So behaviorism, lots of you do the kind of cognitive ism. Learning is a process of acquiring and storing information. And the kind of constructivism, which is this kind of third where you're actively engaged. Learning is a process of constructing subjective reality based on previous knowledge. Behavior is the result of testing personal hypotheses, this kind of work of Piaget and others. Um, and for a long while, this one was one that captured my heart. I'm a past president of the Jean Piaget Society, so um, you know, I'm, I'm very much attached to that. But there are some new kids on the block, even pushing this further. And I think uh, Dr. Smith's talk yesterday on critical thinking and what it is about inquiry that is so special to learning is a really good insight. The other thing I've often um, brought into this discussion are issues of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And several times now, we've had Wendy Grolnick, a professor of psychology, come in and talk to us. She does work on uh, adolescents and middle schoolers learning and what, it, what motivation means to the adolescent child. And you'll be visiting her lab today. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to be toggling back and forth. So hopefully, I can quickly pull up. Um, some of you may know this. I find students really find, uh-oh, no, that's not, sorry. Um, we, there we go, OK. Daniel Pink, have any of you? We're just going to watch a couple minutes of two of his videos. See what he has to say. Daniel Pink. I need to make a confession at the outset here. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did something that I regret, something that I'm not particularly proud of, uh, something that in many ways I wish no one would ever know, but that here I feel kind of obliged to reveal. Um, in the late 1980s, in a moment of youthful indiscretion, I went to law school. Now. <laughs> Um, in America, law is a professional degree. You get your university degree, then you go on to law school. And when I got to law school, I didn't do very well. To put it mildly, I didn't do very well. I, in fact, graduated in the part of my law school class that made the top 90% possible. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I never practiced law a day in my life. I, pretty much wasn't allowed to. Um, <laughs> but today, against my better judgment, against the advice of my own wife, um, I want to try to dust off some of those legal skills, what's left of those legal skills. I don't want to tell you a story. I want to make a case. I want to make a hard-headed, evidence-based, dare I say lawyerly case for rethinking how we run our businesses. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, take a look at this. This is called the candle problem. Some of you might have seen this before. It was created in 1945 by a psychologist named Carl Dunker. Carl Dunker has created this experiment that's used in a whole variety of experiments in behavioral science. And here's how it works. Suppose I'm the experimenter. I bring you into a room. I give you a candle, some thumbtacks, and some matches. And I say to you, your job is to attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Now, what would you do? Many people begin trying to thumbtack the candle to the wall. Doesn't work. Somebody, some people, and I saw somebody kind of make the motion over here, some people have a great idea where they light the match, melt the side of the candle, try to adhere it to the wall. It's an awesome idea, doesn't work. And eventually, after five or 10 minutes, most people figure out the solution, which you can see here. The key is to overcome what's called functional fixedness. You look at that box, and you see it only as a receptacle for the tax, but it can also have this other function as a platform for the candle candle problem. Now, I want to tell you about an experiment using the candle problem done by a scientist named Sam Glucksberg, who's now at Princeton University in the US. This shows the power of incentives. Here's what he did. He gathered his participants and he said, I'm going to time you how quickly you can solve this problem. 
To one group, he said, I'm going to time you to establish norms, averages, for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. If you're the fastest of everyone we're testing here today, you get $20. Okay, now this is several years ago, adjusted for inflation. It's a decent sum of money for a few minutes of work. Okay, it's a nice motivator. Question, how much faster did this group solve the problem? Answer, it took them on average three and a half minutes longer. Three and a half minutes longer. Now this makes no sense, right? I mean, I'm, I'm an American, I believe in free markets, that's not how it's, supp it's supposed to work, right? Okay, so I think you get the idea there. Um, he, he and others, obviously, he's talking about some of the psychological science behind it, have argued that rewards and incentives don't always work. In fact, he has a very nice um, ooh, sorry, uh, video, which I really won't play uh, a lot of them. This is one I think students uh, relate to because this one goes into um, the science of motivation 2.0, 3.0. Some of you may have seen this. 2.0, 3.0 are different ways to describe an approach to motivation. Uh, and I like to use the metaphor of the computer operating system. The computer operating system is a set of software and instructions that run beneath the programs. It's a set of assumptions and protocols that allow what's on the surface to actually operate. And I think society. He goes on to say that. Uh, <laughs> The operating system that we need is a much newer one. So he's making that kind of cognitive-ism. You know, the mind is not a transfer of knowledge kind of thing. It really has to do with motivation and affect towards learning. And as he goes on and here, he goes on and he actually relates it to students. It's a great conversation starter. Adding up columns of figures in a white power office. The problem is, is that that approach to motivation doesn't work for the more sophisticated, complex, creative things that people are doing today. And you know, what happens when a motivational, op when any kind of operating system can't support the programs it's running? It crashes. And I think that's what we're having. We're having a series of crashes because we're using the wrong operating system. And we need to upgrade to Motivation 3.0, which is an operating system built not on this reward and punishment drive, but on our inner drive to direct our own lives, contribute to the world, and get better at things that matter. I think that these principles apply to motivating student performance and, and satisfaction. I mean, stu I mean, these principles of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, this idea that we have these other drives that lead to uh, effectiveness and high performance, is, is a fact of life for humans, whether they're humans who are 46 or 16. And so, then you get the idea there. So what he's arguing, if you think about the slide where we have behaviorism or cognitivism, even constructionism with its intentionality on the part of the individual doesn't always pull up on some of the newer work that talks about purpose and motivation and autonomy. There's a growing literature on that. I think many of you have intuitively, even before you read about the psychology of it, it's something if you're a a practicing teacher, you know that if you aren't engaging the affect of your students, if they aren't motivated to learn, if they don't know why they are learning something, it probably isn't going to work. And so I just wanted to start there, but I thought, well, maybe there's some skeptics, and they say, I'm not sure if all of these ideas are what we think. So I thought of asking you, think about the time. We, yes, Peter. Um, so mastery, autonomy, and what was the third one? Perfect. Okay, aren't they just different types of positive reinforcement? Isn't it really a behaviorist thing? The reward is a less extrinsic and more intrinsic, intrinsic. psychologically or maybe satisfying, but it's not it's not dollars and cents. But I can't see any difference in terms of like, okay, you do this, you get the reward. Mm -hmm. And I think what we could do is we could have a big discussion about where is the locus of control there? So you were talking about internal versus external. We could have debate. I think it's probably not black or white. And I think what we're getting at in the learning sciences now is both what do we do to help, especially for those of us who deal with students, 
students find within themselves their own agency and identity as students at the same time as we're designing context cultures of learning, which is this interaction. That's my own kind of view that I take, but I think um, one could reevaluate that from within the behavior. So they're all different ends. So when I asked you about a memorable experience, we could say, is really memory a good judge of learning? That was the best and quickest way I could quickly get from you all some data to plug in. What I did is I just looked in your answers yesterday, like how many of you said something that was memorable was really something that came from some kind of version of behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, or other? It's not perfect because it's kind of hard to think of the examples of behaviorism and none of you actually talked about it. But a lot of you talked about this kind of information transfer. Like, um, most notably, you know, things, lectures that were particularly salient where a professor talked about X, Y, and Z when you were in college. Or, Dr. Durell, you actually talked about a kind of negative affect related to cognitivism, where somebody was droning on, as I remember it, and you couldn't actually exert any kind of involvement in a lesson. Um, and actually, this scheme became a little problematic because many of the answers that you all gave were hybrids between a couple. Constructivism really had to do with those of you who talked, especially about some of your students liking lessons where they were actively engaged with figuring out hypotheses and they really got to test something out. But actually what was really, really interesting here is both with regard to your own learning and to some of the others, this other category. And the others, because many of you made up that category, talked about your mastery, the purposeful learning experience that you had or a student had, actually being able to connect it to the real world engaged learning, which I think, as Peter has pointed out, could be woven into some of these, but actually, in some ways, brings up new theories of learning that we might want to think about. Like, how are we going to account for that, even if it means that we might need to revise some of our thinking about locus of control? And so I just do this by way of introduction to give ourselves the sense that, although most of us, when we're teaching, intro to psychology, don't get much behind and beyond some of the behaviorism, cognitivism. For a person like me, for my colleagues, when we are actually working on this work, it's much, much more complicated. And we can think about that as we think about, at a separate level, not only how we teach it, but how we enact our own folk theories of what learning is and how we design our classrooms. So this is a issue that I've gotten um, very obsessed with. Um, on the left-hand side, these are um, pictures of high school learning. Not always, but would you recognize yourself? Does this look a little bit like how you do it? This is, even in a place like Clark, many liberal arts schools, we don't have a room this big, but um, intro courses tend to be rather large. And we can think about why it is originally or how we came to set this up and what it tells us about our implicit theories of learning. So if we think about this, let me just go here. And I, I thought what would be interesting is just take a second and think from the perspective, not so much from when you acquired psychology, um, but what are the assumptions about learning when we place college students the we, the, the dark side, the faculty, whoever the we is. And I decided to do this. I had to come up with like one of the best cases so I'm not being critical. And this is also a wonderful resource for some of you. I don't know if you know that Yale University has an open classroom mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Do any of you use some of these lectures? So my colleague, uh, he went to graduate school just around the time I did, Paul Bloom, yeah. who also yeah. specializes in uh, language development, he's written a big book on happiness and all of this. He has his lectures online, so I thought, if we were to think of somebody who, you know, really in the United States, you know, Yale has picked him and put his intro to psych course on, <laughs> let's just think about how would your, what are the assumptions about learning? And how would your students react if they were a student in that class? So let's just play the first couple minutes of his first day class. <laughs>
I'd like to welcome people to Introduction to Psychology. My name is Dr. Paul Bloom and I'm a professor for this course. Uh, if you haven't yet picked up a syllabus from the front of the class, please raise your hand. Are, are we out? Are we at a syllabi? Oh, please raise your hand and one of the teaching fellows will bring it to you if you don't yet have a syllabus. Um, the syllabus is also available on this website. This website will become important to you should you choose to take this class. Um, it will include the syllabus, which will occasionally be revised um, well in advance. Also, all of the class material will be on this site, including copies of the slides I'm presenting. Include. You get the idea. So the first class is kind of a work order, and it's really often with the professor. It's very common. I go around campuses and you watch intro to site. The professor has the back to the audience because that's how they can view their PowerPoint screens often. Um, what are some of the assumptions here? Yes. Well, I mean, the problem is, and we were discussing this yesterday, actually, that you take the child who was in your high school class in May, now it's two months later, and they walk into that, and in the high school class, you have the bells and whistles of collaborative learning, construct constructivism, but cognitive learning. You have the teachers doing really progressive things, workout sheets, technology, computers, and now you tell the same child less than two months later, sit in a chair, face the board, watch the PowerPoint, and listen to the lecture for three hours. And they just, they're used to me for 45 minutes, or everybody in here for 45 minutes. And it, it's just got to be a cult. Even the, idea of, even the idea of talking about a syllabus, a lot of us now are posting our homeworks online or using some type of online way, blogs, Twitter, and now he's handing out a syllabus. It's just got to be amazing culture shock. So there's a, a radically different theory about learning and about the student, and it's, it's not clear, like you say, because there's about two months in between that it's a developmental notion. You might say, well, they're in college now, and we could build that argument. But I also think what we think learning is, and when the university system and the lecture was set up, we had a different theory. We had behaviorism around, but we also especially had theories about kind of the information transfer metaphor of learning where there's an expert and the expert gives knowledge on to others. Even what I'm doing now is very difficult for me often to lecture because it's kind of at odds with my theory about how people learn. But I think there are certain times where a lecture can be excellent. And I think the TED Talks are wonderful today. They have really smart people. And for example, Paul Bloom, I won't play it now, but I have it bookmarked if we have time again, we can always listen to it. He gives a lecture on behaviorism. It's awesome. It's deep and he ties it in a way that many of you <coughs> may not have the time to do. But it's really important for students to learn. It's the history of ideas. It relates, you know, Skinner to the work that came before and that came after. And that's something in our intro lectures in college that we quite a lot of the kind of intellectual history, the deep inquiry. Why did the person have the question? What was coming before? What are they responding to? And often in, in the kind of high school blocks where you don't have an hour and a half to go on, you don't have that kind of time, nor would the students necessarily in, engage with that level. Yes? Um, I would say I watched all of Paul Bloom's course online before I started teaching intro. And I think the whole lecture thing is a gamble. You're gambling on the quality of the of the instructor, and you're betting that people will be able to stay awake. I don't think when the lecture format was developed, did we know how long the human attention span was? I don't <laughs> and think I so. would say the jury. We don't even have to say it's a gamble. We know right. it's not working. Right. I mean, that's one of the most interesting things for me. Eight years of this, I mean, it's really shaken me up year in, year out. The beginning was a hypothesis. It's not even a hypothesis, it's testing theory. You guys really have down what it takes to keep students of roughly that age engaged. You know, you really want to think You can about. do it for an hour. I mean, you watch these, you watch these lectures, he's clearly, got the he's clearly got the class engaged. He will be interactive with them also. But yeah, and he's dealing with Yale students, which mm -hmm. right. is, so right. it's no critique. It's just saying, mm -hmm. we have to think about affordances of each. And also, my main point here is hidden assumptions about learning. The lecture came up 
at a time when we believed that learning was about transferring from an expert to a novice. That's the German model that Clark founded, the first kind of American graduate education. Just real short, there is always an appropriate time for lecture. There's discussion is not always appropriate. Cooperative learning is not always appropriate. But just one thing that we need to remember is that we need to vary the techniques we use. So we don't want to say lecture is not good. Yeah. Lecture is excellent, depending on the purpose of the lesson yeah. and what you want the students to learn. Yeah. So when I was prepping for this, I had written um, and talked with Mike a little bit about what I was planning to do. And I was actually planning to spend more time in redesigning some of the work based on some of the newer learning science work. And actually, you made the comment that you know people actually want to hear some of the work and not just work with each other. And there are other sessions for that. And, and I think, in general, we all can use moments and using it at the right time. So let me push along here. And what I want to say about this, then, is, is this is just my intro. It's like, we, we have different assumptions. So why is it that many of you do this more engaged learning, this other category, this affect? And I think it was um, something that becomes very transformative for students of different ages when they actually get very, very involved in the very questions. And what does that mean? Those are some of the issues that I want to get involved with. So we've kind of talked about the technical <laughs> treatment of learning. You can go onto YouTube if you want to see it. Uh, the uh, lecture form by Paul Bloom gives an excellent discussion of learning, the history of learning. You can pull out a couple of minutes on that. But I want to turn to the other four kind of issues from the perspective of the newer work in learning sciences. Just what are some snippets of it, and how might it impact any of us who deal day in, day out with students? And I want to start way back with implicit learning and the brain. And again, I'm just going to pull from somebody who I think is really, really good at describing that, Patricia Cool, and tell you a little bit. Yeah, this is a book I've brought in, and I've included in your reader the first chapter, which gives an overview. This is an awesome book. The author is a good friend of mine, Keith Sawyer. Um, and it summarizes lots of the trends. We only have a few minutes today. But I think it's important to start with babies and think about how sophisticated they are. Sometimes we underestimate how much students can do. And when you think about what they're doing and what work like hers has shown, experimental work, what babies are capable of, it always reminds me, I, I watch that all the time and think about it when I go into a graduate class or a college class because of the month for that. I also love thinking about informal learning. What does the research on informal learning, learning outside academia, teach us about how people learn? And how might we put that in? I think intuitively many of you need to be done going on that. And then formal learning, research that tells us how within academic setting, how expertise develops, and what we know about the depth of expertise, really about finally, how, what are the mechanisms for making learning happen? I'm just going to briefly touch on some of these. So implicit learning and the brain. We know that learning produces neural connections, and that humans, normally developing humans, very, very early on need lots of this, and they get lots of this. Exposure establishes these kind of neural connections that lead the brain to process information in an ideal way for a particular input. And it's really, really interesting to look at the research. Like, does it make a difference if a baby hears, for example, stimuli from a parent or a loving caregiver versus a television? What do they learn? Normally developing children have a really keen capacity to watch and imitate other people. So I've just given you some snippets here. This, I'll play just a little clip from Patricia Cool, K-U-H-L on TED Talks, has an awesome lecture on babies and some of the science. I'll show you a little clip, so just to whet your appetite in case you want to show it in your room. She's one of the collaborators with Andy Meltzoff and Alison Gopnik, who colleagues of mine, who have written this book, The Scientist in the Crib. It's really like the baby of scientists. It's really Piaget getting going, you know, like how inquisitive they are. And then 
my really close colleague, Mike Tomasello, I spent my last sabbatical working with his done work on primates and human babies and early language learners. And people like Mike and myself and Alison Gopnik and others, we all look at how babies learn the complexity of language, those things like I study ergative markers and Hindi, yeah. How kids learn the case system in German effortlessly, though I struggle with it all the time. And so babies, they not only need this stuff, but they can find patterns. We call them pattern finders. Normally developing children across the globe, wherever we go, will sort these complex systems out. Not on their own, with the help of their cultures, which are preparing them. And just to get a little sense of the science behind this, I'm sorry, I, I'm going back and forth, but it's, it's just a little snippet here. Um, <coughs> I want you to take a look at this baby. What you're drawn to are her eyes and the skin you love to touch. But today I'm going to talk to you about something you can't see. What's going on up in that little brain of hers? The modern tools of neuroscience are demonstrating to us that what's going on up there is nothing short of rocket science. And what we're learning is going to shed some light on what the romantic writers and poets described as the celestial openness of the child's mind. What we see here is a mother in India, and she's speaking Koro, which is a newly discovered language, and she's talking to her baby. What this mother and the 800 people who speak Koro in the world understand that it, to preserve this language, they need to speak it to the babies. And therein lies a critical puzzle. Why is it that you can't preserve a language by speaking to you and I, to the adults? Well, it's got to do with your brain. What we see here is that language has a critical period for learning. The way to read this slide is to look at your age on the horizontal axis. <laughs> You've done that. And you'll see on the vertical your skill at acquiring a second language. The babies and children are geniuses until they turn seven, and then there's a systematic decline. After puberty, we fall off the map. No scientists dispute this curve, but laboratories all over the world are trying to figure out why it works this way. Work in my lab is focused on the first critical period in development, and that is the period in which babies try to master which sounds are used in their language. We think by studying how the sounds are learned, we'll have a model for the rest of language, and perhaps for critical periods that may exist in childhood for social, emotional, and cognitive development. So we've been studying the babies using a technique that we're using all over the world in the sounds of all languages. The baby sits on a parent's lap, and we train them to turn their heads when a sound changes, like from ah to e. If they do so at the appropriate time, the black box lights up, and a panda bear pounds a drum. A six-monther adores the task. What have we learned? Well, babies all over the world are what I like to describe as citizens of the world. They can discriminate all the sounds of all languages, no matter what country we're testing and what language we're using. And that's remarkable, because you and I can't do that. We're culture-bound listeners. We can discriminate the sounds of our own language, but not those of foreign languages. So the question arises, when do those citizens of the world turn into the language-bound listeners that we are? And the answer, before their first birthdays. What you see here is performance on that head turn task for babies tested in Tokyo and in the United States, here in Seattle, as they listen to ra and la, sounds important to English but not to Japanese. So at six to eight months, the babies are totally equivalent. Two months later, something incredible occurs. The babies in the United States are getting a lot better. The babies in Japan are getting a lot worse. But both of those groups of babies are preparing for exactly the language that they're going to learn. So the question is, what's happening? during this critical two-month period. This is the critical period for sound development, but what's going on up there? So there are two things going on. The first is that the babies are listening intently to us, and they're taking statistics as they listen to us talk. 
They're taking statistics. So listen to two mothers speaking motheries, the universal language we use when we talk to kids. First in English and then in Japanese. I love your big blue eyes. So pretty and nice. So what I'm telling you is that during the production of speech, when babies listen, what they're doing is taking statistics on the language that they hear. And those distributions grow. And what we've learned is that babies are sensitive to the statistics, and the statistics of Japanese and English are very, very different. English has a lot of R's and L's, the distribution shows. And the distribution of Japanese is totally different, where we see a, a group of intermediate sounds, which is known as the Japanese R. So babies absorb the statistics of the language, and it changes their brains. It changes them from the citizens of the world to the culture-bound listeners that we are. But we as adults are no longer absorbing those statistics. It goes on, and I think she does a wonderful job of going on and showing even further studies in a very accessible way. So I, I highly recommend watching the, the 10 minutes. She also has longer versions on there, and there's several other colleagues who do some of the demonstrations. But think about that, especially in light of yesterday's talk, both of the talks, where we kind of heard that sometimes students are a little afraid of statistics. They're a little bit afraid of numbers and all of that. And yet as babies, isn't that amazing that they can do that? And you have this, so um, Patricia Kula does it with sounds. And that's probably the easiest and quickest way to treat, uh, touch on this topic is through that sounds. Because we all know different languages have different sound patterns. But also many languages have these things like case and uh, tense and aspects. So, for example, in English, you can talk about an action as ongoing versus something that and I see you nodding because I know you're bilingual. So, can you give an example of something like in English um, versus um, your native language that is a little bit different like that? Um, do you have the. Yeah. Well, when you, were, when you were talking about sounds, it's unbelievable, but I know that there are sounds that I just can't, can't pronounce, and I listen to other people talk, right. and I know that I'm not pronouncing it right. the way it is, but it's just I don't have it in me, I don't have those sounds. Right. So sound is an easy one. So like, back to the verbs. So um, in German, you have to go a very long way to say, I am jumping, meaning if I were to do it right now, and jump up and down, is something that's ongoing and progressive. You basically say, I jump, or he jumps, OK? It may be ongoing, but you don't mark it with that ing. And like, how do kids learn this in one language and not the other? They listen to the statistics, and there's all kinds of studies, and that's often what I've lectured on. But I use this to illustrate the point. Long before we can see them tinkering away, yeah? They really are tinkering. And I remember once I told a very well-known professor, Catherine Nelson, that I thought kids were learning language almost effortlessly. Mm -hmm. And she stopped me in my tracks. She said, it's not effortlessly. They spend their waking moments the way you all would get really intense about something you love and are passionate about doing. And they start, and they work on it, and they work on it, and she's right. And we know this from foreign language learners, if any of you have, and I know last night, um, we were talking about having foreign exchange students in your house, and they'll learn a slang word, and they'll work on it. They'll pry and put it everywhere in the conversation. We've all done this. You learn a new phrase. You try it out. But really, there's something very early on in the first years of life. We have the human capacity, and that's not a capacity that is across the animal kingdom to be able to do these sorts of things. Mike Tomasello's book on human cognition and some of its work on cooperation, early cooperation, is just very, very insightful way to show that it's part of our human capacity. So when we're thinking about learning, we, we really should keep in mind that from the get-go, we have in us huge capacity, often untapped within educational circles. Let's turn to informal learning. And to get this concrete and very visual for you, just think for yourself, and if somebody's willing to share in the audience, 
about a learning episode, and I'm interested in one, something you've learned to do, and I would prefer it not only to be outside the classroom, but not even to be academic. We do this with our faculty here in workshops as we're thinking about how to bring in what we know from the learning sciences in informal learning into our teaching. So let, think of something you've learned to do that, that maybe not be academic. Does anybody? Yeah? You first, go ahead. Skiing. Skiing. Snow. 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 Snow skiing, okay. Downhill skiing or? Yeah, I'm a water skier. I used to be. Okay, so downhill or cross country? Downhill. Downhill. One or two things that stick out in your mind about the learning. How did you learn to do it? I fell a lot. Okay. I had to learn how to control the lower part of my body. I had to do things differently than I had ever done before. Just walking and moving on the slopes. Um, so I had to really learn to control the muscles. And I did it by watching and practicing and watching and practicing and failing and, and watching failing. and practicing again. Great. I'm going to hold that. There's just such rich stuff there. I want to go to Peter. Yeah? Learning how to play guitar and sing at the same time. <coughs> All right. And talk with us a little bit about that. How um, did you do that? It's similar to that thing about the upper and lower body. Um, singers, singers will, will have phrasing around the words the same, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll play, let's say, a 4-4 four, four beat, right? right? They'll play in and around that 4-4 four, four beat. That's what makes singing interesting. Everybody's on the beat all the time. Right. It's very boring. So singers will diverge from that. Sure. Right? So you have, to, you have to get the phrasing down for a given song. Right. right? Then what you have to do is, is match that almost exactly with what you're playing guitar. Right. That is the chordal background. So you have to maintain a rhythm in your mind. Right. Right. So when, when you did that, how did you come to that? Was that like your own, were you in your room practicing that, piecing it together yourself? Were there experts helping you? Did you take? I was in a soundproof area because nobody wanted to hear that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Say so. Hear it. That's an unholy sort of not pleasant thing to hear somebody trying to get both their sides of the brain to work together with them. It's interesting when you work on these kind of things, and, and I really encourage people to talk about informal learning things you've learned. Some of the similar characteristics will come up, like failing, getting it wrong, over and over. It takes a ton of practice. Mike? I think uh, Peter's music example, like the phrasing, the vocal phrasing, is just such a great example of uh, informal learning because you're, you've all heard songs forever. And you have a feeling of someone who does something with a song that someone else didn't do. It's the same words, yeah. it's the same melody, it's the same. But you get a feel for yeah. good phrasing. Same with sense of humor. Right. You're learning things like that. It's all informal learning from the time you're, you're aware. And I love what you're playing on there and pulling out, which could be for both of these examples, is the timeline, the way in which Experts can almost be implicit in your learning. So maybe each of you were visualizing, you might have known you weren't exactly the same as that downhill skier you aspired to be, but you were going to keep at it. Yes? Just one more thing to play off of Mike said. Um, there's the technical aspect of both singing and playing, that is the chords and the notes and how you produce the sound out of your, out of your, out of your lungs and the throat and so on. Then there's also the emotional expressiveness of it. Right? So you have, to get, you have to get the feel of the playing. Right. You have to get the feel of the singing. And that's a whole nother, whole nother game. Right. So this is why I practice away from people. Right. You know, at first it's like, See? Getting tired yet? But after a while, I, it yeah. starts to flow into an expressive bowl. People right. will often find me with my little iPad outside our music department over outside the building where you can hear the students doing that and what may be something you say most people don't want to hear I love it the developmentalist in me I can go there I know Tuesdays at 10 o'clock somebody's gonna be practicing I love going back and listening and it's over and over and it's off key and, and they're starting to get it right but I mean that's the pattern maker in me and I think you yourself, there's issues of mastery, there's issues of purpose. You know, you really, you want to get it right and you keep at it. It's really a fun exercise to talk with people 
especially students, about this kind of thing. We don't tend to think about it in formal learning context. Most everybody has something that they learned once that they really put a lot of effort into and thought about and they like to talk about it. It's really interesting. The first time I did this exercise with faculty, I gave them homework before they came in. I told you I'm, I'm known in like every circle I am to have people come prepared. There's no point to come to a workshop if you haven't given a lot of thought. And actually, nine-tenths of the faculty failed and I, I had to like give them time out to just really reboot because they had a hard time thinking of anything other than academics. They came in, they had a geography class, they had a algebra class in seventh grade and I was saying, you know, no, I want something non-academic. I want to think about something you learned informally outside the academy. But other than talking to academic professors, for the most part, this exercise can work really well. There was a hand up. Where, where was that? I'll, I'll go on. Um, with regard to informal learning, I think it's really, really interesting if you just focus on the pictures here to think about some of the things. I mean, some of the things that, like, if you talk to little kids, which I do, like, talk to me about something that you've learned. I mean, tying the shoe is a big deal, right? And then some kids wear Velcro, but at some point they learn, I think, to tie their shoe. I get a lot of stories about pie baking, yeah? People will talk about sports driving a stick shift car. Um, lots of people will talk about their kids learning if they're really challenged, those faculty members. Sometimes they have to switch them over to their kids and they can talk about learning to talk on the phone to a relative or Skype or something like that, learning to use a computer. What's really interesting to me about these is in contrast to, say, thinking about Paul Bloom's lecture where we have a hidden assumption that there is an expert who has the knowledge and you simply tell the novices and they're going to acquire it in academic settings. Most of these, you would not go to a manual. I don't know about you guys, but how many of you learned to drive a stick shift car? I drive a stick shift car. Okay, First time for me, Hills of San Francisco. I don't <laughs> recommend it. One of those designated driver kind of experiences. I became the newly defined designated driver and I uh, did not know that the car that I was driving was going to be stick shift and there I was practicing but um, yeah it was an experience not the way I would recommend it but I also wouldn't recommend going to the manual right and reading it, it might be a starting point um, but how did some of you learn to do something like learning to drive a stick shift you practice right Sometimes you put yourself there. You probably start on the flatlands. Like for me, I took my kids up to the Worcester Airport, which is not functioning anymore. It's a huge parking lot, basically. Let them drive around, let them fail, let them make the kind of noises that nobody wants to listen to <laughs> on the Worcester roads. And then over time, you gradually increase. You let them do a little lap around a kind of quiet street, a parking lot that's on a Sunday morning not too many people are frequent. So we stage it. There are certain things that we learn. And some of the kind of core features of informal learning that learning scientists have studied, and it seems so obvious, so you guys are like, oh yeah, that's obvious, but the studies to me are fascinating. Informal learning is contextual. And what I mean by that is you learn. So when you're learning to ski, the texture of the snow <laughs> makes a difference. Any of you who come from the East Coast, who went to the West Coast and tried downhill skiing. Any of you from the West Coast who came to the East Coast, let alone the Midwest, these are different experiences. It's highly contextual. And you think about how you move your body, music, um, sushi. This is an example I get a lot. Anybody here have a hobby of making sushi? Usually I'm in a crowd. Any, any sushi makers? Yeah, so people will tell me stories about how they were really good at making sushi and then they went out to the west coast high altitude and like the rice texture changes and you've really got to adapt your sushi making to be able to be good at it so learning informal learning is contextual and what does it mean that it's socially situated can anybody give me an example of something they learned in an informal context that illustrates how learning is social it's a social activity anything Cooking and transferred from, you know, from family member to family member. Right. Usually so in a, a, a 
Right, so we have multi-generational learning, passing on the family recipe, and it has a lot of meaning. Yeah, there's an identity to it, being able to cook, often associated with holidays and customs and get-togethers. That's one example. It turns out that powerfully impacts learning. That's one of the reasons why these travel sort of activities are very, you know, the people who go to the wine country and learn to make wine and bike around, they develop a kind of in-group and they keep in touch through social networking and all these work because learning takes place often when you're in a community of practice, when you turn to others. One reason why I think this conference <laughs> begins to work. People develop and they feel more comfortable by the first or second evening to share. And activity is central. The doing is really important, you know, over and over and over, not just hearing, but experiencing. And the question that many of us as learning scientists are raising is, what can we take from all of this and place into formal learning contexts? Because there's a lot of powerful learning going on here. And we know sometimes in academic settings, the learning's a little more hard to do. And I'd say that's what so many of you have capitalized on, that we are just waking up in the higher ed uh, circles and beginning to think about that not all learning takes place that way. School is really unusual in being one of the only venues, yeah, where you kind of take the learning often out of its continuous experience, yeah, where it is actually done and you do it in a classroom. You don't often practice it. And a lot of what you all are beginning to do <coughs> is try and engage the student. Now the question is, is what you're doing authentic? Because that's the one thing with informal learning. And we saw some examples yesterday when you two gave activities. I was thinking about when you were giving activities, which of these are things experts might really do? Which of these things engage a student, which is a very important component, and they could learn a concept, but may not match the practice? And it's good to get those balanced out and know, just like with a lecture, what is a good point in a lecture to give a lecture, what is a good point to have an opportunity to do something authentic versus do something highly engaging, although no expert would do. What's authentic? Authentic. An example of authentic, I think, just to go back to what you heard yesterday, was when uh, Deb gave the brain um, example, and you talked about the diaries, and the students had to learn all those parts of the brain. And a very authentic experience was when those High school students were teaching fourth graders. It's they an were writing the books. They, they were, were writing the books writing like an author writing. would write. That's, That's authentic. a very authentic. So authentic if means you wanted to try to define it would be producing a product. It might not. It could producing be producing an artifact, producing artifacts are central. Artifacts are so central to learning. I'm glad that you brought that up. It can also be why would an essay be inauthentic? It does not need to be, okay. and it can be. So if, and, and I have powerful um, experience with this, and I'll tell you a little bit more tomorrow when we have Amy come in and give her lecture on adolescent sleep. I used to do something where I would assign the students to write for me. A simple change to say, same students, you are writing for the school board. And they were. Some subset of those essays went to the school board, different genres. Different essays, same students in different parts of the semester. The authentic one is when there is a purpose, a real world purpose to it. Or in any way, it not only simulates through role play, but actually demonstrates. So it need not be a product, it could be a process. Yes? I was to me, and I, I don't know if we're on the same page, but to me, authentic, the essay is something that's just happening in a school setting. Whereas if I'm writing a letter to the President of the United States, right. or if I'm writing a book review on Amazon, or I'm writing a blog or a news article, now I'm doing something that's right. authentic that would happen in the quote, quote, real world, as opposed to this institution we call school. So it goes back to my very first picture, where you saw those students there. It's one of our most powerful experiences on campus in this building. We have a husband-wife team that takes students also to Alaska to actually collect the fish that they use in their biological experience. A lot of students are running around. You would not believe the sophisticated 
do, not right away. And we're going to get into that. They, they apprentice, if you will. But there's something about authentic learning. So think about when I was a kid, I don't know about all of you, when I took driver's ed, we had to go into a little, um, little room that had fake cars, and they gave us video. And then we did the practice as well <coughs> out on the streets. And those are different experiences. They serve different functions. And my point is simply, keep in mind that authentic learning is powerful, where the learning doesn't just simulate, but actually is usable knowledge for somebody somewhere, or in some way actually is part of what authentic experts do when they do that. It's not always possible to weave into every lesson, but if you can do it once or twice, it's really, really important. And we don't do enough of that in school. So let's just quickly turn over to formal learning so we have some time for discussing. Because this is the heart of what you do. And you guys know most of this. So instead of doing a couple of slides, I'm just going to put it here. This is right out of uh, the Cambridge Handbook. You have this in your readings. But this is a summary of just tons and tons of literature and studies that say, OK, memorization, you all know this, the kind of traditional classroom practices often use learners treat course material as unrelated to other knowledge. So they're memorizing for the sake of memorizing. You could imagine something like Marianne Weiser's sheet with sensation and perception lecture yesterday with all those names. A student who learns all those names may do very well on a test, but as you all know, they're not relating the knowledge to anything else, so it doesn't really stick. Um, knowledge is treated as facts that are handed down. Remember what I was saying? One of the neat things about a lecture, it allows you to treat knowledge as handed down with a purpose, as connected to other ideas. It turns out Learning scientists who study deep learning practices find it may not always just be that they're engaged, but learners who are relating new material to previously learned material do much better in the long run in knowing that material deeply than if they don't. That's probably why most of you are really good at opening and closing your classes with where you are. Um, you, you are seasoned teachers. Not all new teachers do that. Learners, remember what I told you about the babies. They seek patterns and underlying principles from the get-go, almost without any aid. Anything you can do to help play off that tendency is shown in research to help learners. Learners come to understand when they have to talk about. That's like that exercise you did when you actually have to teach something, but also when they dialogue. That's why breakout groups or these triplets where you talk to your neighbor. Having to dialogue, is turns out, and reflection. I think this one is really cool. Sometimes just stopping in your tracks and just having to reflect really changes learners, you know, keeping journals, doing portfolios where they themselves have to react on their own drafts of papers. It's amazing to take a random set of papers in a college setting, have an experienced graduate student or faculty member look over the first half of the student papers, take the second half of the student papers, have the students themselves look them over and put the comments they think they would get, and then exchange. Now, the students may not see everything that a faculty member or graduate student teaching assistant might have. You'd be surprised at how far students can push themselves just through their own reflection. And I put the two pictures, that's me years ago, in a kind of traditional classroom with the chalk in hand. I don't even think we have chalkboards on campus anymore, but that was in Latin America where I had a wonderful opportunity uh, to teach. Um, this is how some learning takes place, where students are really out in the field. But no, they're not just doing. These other things have to come to be. They have to be finding patterns. It's not enough just to go on a field trip. They have to relate the material there for the studies to show that it's really helpful. And we have tons of evidence that a lot of the engaged learning doesn't work. So if you think about this, where we really get it is in the idea of expertise. So lots of studies have been done. And the 
The two most well-known are, and I don't know why this is, I have a hypothesis, chess players and teachers. Isn't that interesting? I think it's because it kind of relates to learning and so teachers are available. But you can look at novices, novice teachers, novice chess players, and there are studies, tons of them, and you can look at teachers who are novices and who are experts. And they learn differently. Think about what this means for your classes. So some of you were talking, how many of you teach a two semester psych class? Or students in a school where students take more than one semester. Even there, you'll find the way learners learn at the very beginning of an introduction to a discipline and even six months later into a discipline is radically different. So what do we know from this about deep learning and adaptive expertise? Well, one thing we know is just showing students or novices actual expertise or videos does not work. It doesn't matter if we just show babies videos of language or certain social things that they can imitate. It's not enough. A novice doesn't know what to pick out. Now with babies, we cannot always tell what's going on in the head. And the neat thing with the Patricia Cool tape is they have begun to develop some really interesting head mechanisms. And you can see all the things firing up in her lecture and all in the later part around eight minutes in. And it is a really cool device, but it doesn't really tell us what they're thinking. We just know what lights up. But we do know from studies of teachers, Harley highly articulate people, and especially chess players. What is it that leads a novice to make the move? You can ask them after that, why did you make that move? Why did you not? There can be studies of their hesitations and all. And what you find out is they do not look at expertise in the same way. So you put an expert in watching an expert. So watching a downhill skier, you put an expert, expert guitar player, expert at stick shift and they'll notice something that other people won't notice. My husband broke his collarbone uh, recently and we were driving with a, another couple and they don't drive stick shift and um, they didn't say anything on the way there. On the way home, a different person sat in the front seat who's an experienced stick shift driver and what caught me is they, they said, Michael, you're, you're doing your, uh, your stick shift with your left hand. And it was because of he was compensating. He didn't even notice that he had switched his behavioral pattern. But this expert, this guy has been driving, he's like the longest driving stick shift. He started when he was like 10 years old, the family truck out on the farm. He noticed that. A, a novice sitting in the front seat isn't going to notice some of these patterns, but humans notice things, especially as they have increased expertise. So they, they don't just learn from experience. And this is so central to how you set up your engaged learning in your class. Students do not learn from experience, according to learning science. Rather, experts like yourself have to tie that knowledge and skill into organized sets of ideas. You have to help them see the concepts and procedures to be able to do it. And that's one of the things Mother East does. It looked like um, you were, jump in. Um, I was just gonna mention, just coming here, if I had come here before I started teaching psychology, I wouldn't be able to pick up as much. But because I've had it for eight years, it's, it's such a different learning experience and going, oh, I can connect that to what I've already done. Yeah. So, what are they, so I really appreciate the idea that you want someone to have at least two years experience before they even come here. Absolutely, and that's an example of how learning science has designed how something takes place. Because there are moments where you're more or less ready for the learning you do. And you all are in a position to design environments to prepare the students to be ready for something like that. Let me just talk about how you might do that. How might you help that kind of shift? Because that's what we're all trying to do with learning. And what we know, and this is something actually Marianne Weiser is part of the National Research Council that has worked on this learning progression, something you all probably know that you, 
build knowledge sequentially. You really want to think about what you're placing where in the syllabus, in your lecture, in terms of how can you piecemeal the knowledge so you're not just throwing them in the game completely. Humans will learn better if they move, for example, from the concrete to the abstract. And don't forget the abstract. That gets back to the point about when to lecture, when not. Sometimes you need to kind of foreground a few things. You guys do this already. Get them in an activity. But don't run out of time and forget to tie it back in and help them see that abstract. And you can use two other really, you can use many mechanisms. The two that I get most excited about are reflection and something Vygotsky and others have talked about, scaffolding. And I don't know, have any of you ever heard, this is a very much in education circles just coming in. It's an awful title for it. They obviously needed a marketer to help them think of something snazzy. Legitimate peripheral participation. Anybody ever heard of that? It's huge in the learning sciences. Anybody heard what that is? You Scaffolding? What is scaffolding? Give an example of scaffolding. Yeah, go ahead. In our district, we have to do scaffolded learning goals. So we have to have, we went from, like I said, reading, then we went to learning styles, now we're doing scaffolding, where you have to have a very simple, basic learning goal, then your target goal, then your complex goal. And you have to teach each child to go through the process. Right. So, so yes. Vygotsky talked about something called the zone of proximal development. Yeah, zone of, anybody heard about this? So if we go back to the original study, I was about 12 at the time, but one of the first empirical versions of that, I was an undergraduate research assistant on. It was an article by Jim Wirtz, and you'll see at the end in that <laughs> citation there in child development, Budwig, that's me. And it was so exciting to see this. So basically what I did one summer when I was in college is I, I put kids down with a puzzle. And there was a, a model puzzle, and then there was another puzzle they had to do. And not only did the puzzle pieces fit, but we wanted them to model the colors. It was a cargo truck, and they had to like put the pieces in a certain way. The mother caught on. She knew how to do the puzzle. She had to train her kid, if you will, to do the puzzle. And what you saw was how over time we videotaped them until they could get it right. The mother kind of backed off and all the children but one, and that, that Daya had some very special issues. But what we saw was a kind of, over time the mother would, instead of saying, put the red one here, and she'd pick up the red piece and then place it right in front of her two-year-old, she would say, what's next? And then maybe one time later she would say, what goes next, with no pointing. And then the child would just do the whole puzzle themselves. And for some diets, this took very long. For others, it might have just taken two sessions. But the zone of proximal development suggests that, just like Dr. Smith was saying yesterday, these aren't trait. Like, it's not like you can do it or you can't. At any given time, a learner has bandwidth. And it depends on the design around them, the environment around them, and whether the scaffolding idea is that one can do more with some guidance than they can do on their own, and over time, they can do it on their own. Well, that's really important even to graduate education or scaffolding with new faculty when they come into the building and all. So that's scaffolding. Legitimate peripheral participation. I'll show you what that gets at. What this says is if you look at informal learning in the learning sciences, how people learn to ski, how people learn to play the guitar, how people learn to dance. There are often times when you're socially situated. Cooking is a wonderful example. Little kids will be kind of sitting around the kitchen island observing quietly. You're a novice. Novices often watch from afar and increasingly move to the center over time. Think about a dance class. Think about whatever, where you have experts. And we have now begun to integrate this kind of learning science research into how we involve undergraduates in research. We don't necessarily launch them on their own projects. They become part of a community of experts. And over time, they're acquiring not only the skills and the knowledge, but the identity that goes along. One of my favorite um, pictures 
is from dance classes. If you watch how people come in at the beginning of the semester, they often don't dance like this, uh, come in dressed like this if they're novices. They might come in in their shorts or something, and the experts always wear all the fancy socks and things like that. But with legitimate peripheral participation and learning through a community of practice, it involves a combining of formal and informal knowledge. People come together to learn because they have common activities in mind. In fact, the experts actually want to learn something too. One of you wrote this down in your sheet. I think you sit somewhere around here. I can't remember who it was, but you're learning with your students. It turns out people learn best when you're all learning together. And one of the most scary things for instructors at the college level is like when I say, it's really important that at times you be in the mix of the learning, that you're doing something not in your comfort zone. What you're developing often are shared repertoires. And these develop over time. And sometimes the newcomers in the group add something. They add new ways to do the repertoires. That's one reason why we faculty like undergraduate students or high school teachers in our research labs over the summer. We bring in high school teachers all the time in the sciences. They come involved in a group wicked smart people and they haven't been doing the work with those blinders on like in that Glucksburg um, example and they think of new ways they say oh we could do it this way and you're like wow why didn't I think of that you're part of a community and it doesn't just refer to how you do things locally in your classroom it turns out learning takes place much better if you're part of some broader so maybe you could think about this with tops to me one hugely important thing about the TOPS program are the resources available and the connecting the people, something that this workshop does as well, people from all over. And if your students can connect to one another, that's incredibly powerful to get beyond the local classroom, which is a community of interest, to a community of real practitioners. One of the reasons why working with real world things as opposed to simulation is important is that there's a process of participation in which the practices of the social communities are involved and the identities. And if you watch when you have your students doing real world kind of activities, I would imagine your students model some of your behaviors and all. I go sometimes to undergraduate research presentations. I've actually been to one that our videographer in the back as then I was blown away by her presentation. And one of the really cool things that often will happen is that as students really become involved in these communities, they start dressing and bringing on the identities of those around them, okay? And they begin to walk and talk. And that's part, it's much more than physically being engaged. It's psychologically you're adopting the whole Identity. I'm sure you've seen that with teachers, like new teachers, seasoned teachers, and those in between. You're acquiring that identity. You, you shake and move comfortably, just like somebody who drives a stick shift. You know them when they're comfortable, and you know when they're not. Those are the kind of things. So legitimate peripheral participation just simply means to the extent that at times, if there are other psych teachers in your building, you can combine your classes. If there have been students who've taken, they're in that second semester and can help with the newcomers, that is powerful. Now, I think it's a little bit more of a challenge in the high school teaching of psychology. We have rich access to allowing undergraduate students from the get-go to get involved in some of the all the way on up but there might be ways to think about that. There might be local universities in which you can get involved and never hesitate to write. I get requests like that from time to time to the extent that we can work on something like that. We love it for all the reasons I mentioned. It really shakes us up a lot. And I know that at times some of the TOPS teachers have gotten involved with James Cordova and his marriage research. Um, students have used that in statistics learning in a high school setting several years ago. So it's not impossible to try and find ways. But my main point here is simply to understand that it's more than just the doing in the learning sciences that engages students. It's really about doing common activities that have kind of real world value to them because you're developing habits of mind and habits of practice, repertoires of practice, that are what the doers do, which is essentially what you're doing with skiing and cooking and guitar over time. So 
Let me just end <coughs> here by talking about effective learning. If we look at somebody like Bransford, who's just been one of the big leaders in learning science and thinking about how learning takes place, um, we can use the learning sciences to create learning environments and study the effects of these environments. And one of the things a handful of us are starting to do is really trying to combine the three factors that I was talking about. True learning, we have a lot to learn from each other. We used to work in silos, yeah? People like me, I was on that kind of implicit brain learning, early learning, and we never talked to the people who were doing the formal learning. We didn't even go to conferences together. Um, informal learning, oh, that was more the anthropologists out there, and you know, maybe I'd collide with them sometimes. But it turns out many of us are beginning to say, if we could just come together and speak with one another, we have groups where we, we have been working more closely together. There's really, from the first group, we learn what the human potential is. There's a lot of possibility there in our students that we aren't tapping into. They find patterns they will sink effort into something if they're engaged. Informal learning just gives us huge cues to the multimodality of learning. To take cooking as an example, not only do you learn from a family, you use recipes, you use the internet, you watch cooking shows. I mean, you can get you know, chef's tools to aid versus not. And so informal learning, you're often using multiple ways, not just an expert giving you that knowledge, not just grandma teaching you how to do the pie, and you get down there by yourself and you make seven pies and you throw six of them out, but <laughs> you learn, the same with skiing, you fall, you get up, you fall, you get up. And formal learning, we could weave some of those findings into how we think about formal learning, but I also want to encourage us to remember that the formal learning has something to teach us too. Remember about all that connection of ideas, that the learning doesn't stick, you can't just show the novices good examples. They need a framework, yeah? And we have to help, we can help in formal learning prepare, especially through guidance, notions of zone of proximal development, some of these kind of ways to arrange our settings to facilitate learning. But a lot of work has to go on with inquiry, especially on the part of individuals. So basically, where many learning scientists have focused is on adaptive expertise. And what we see there, what I mean by that is, so you're really good at something. Each of you, think of something you're really good at. You got something? I know you're all really good at something. Think about a time where the, like, something goes wrong. You can continue on and adapt. I mean, that's really an expert, you know. You're not just able to do it in a couple of situations when everything is structured for you. But like the electricity went out, you know, for two weeks in New England due to some ice storm, and you'd be okay without your PowerPoint, or you'd be okay without your media. Researchers have shown that experts and novices use different thinking strategies. I think that's a little bit about what Pam, uh, what you were getting at with teachers. Over time, you develop a flexibility to be able to use the situation and figure out what you can draw in. And there's a lot of learning science to suggest that as you become more expert, you read the situation differently. You adjust your body when you're skiing. You recognize that when it's warmer, your butter's gonna melt a little quicker and you've gotta change your technique in making that pie. So when you're studying chess players, when you're studying teachers, one of the things of becoming an expert is to learn to pull up on those cues. And that's what you, as teachers, are also helping your students do in many implicit ways every day. So I wanted to end there. I was going to take some time, but I think I'm going to change instead to discussion. And we can talk about this informally. But I thought it would be interesting to just play with a little time to think about one of your favorite classroom activities. And think about you know something like if you were to come in, many of you have turned in or had share experiences. And it's really fun to think about the linkage. I do this with new faculty at Clark. Think about what's your favorite way, you know, your favorite lecture experience, learning experience with students. And then think about it from the perspective of the learning sciences. Have you really maxed on everything you could be doing with regard to relating it to students' pattern making, with regard to implicit learning, informal learning, formal learning, and the science behind it. But 
we'll, we'll skip on that. And I'll just end by simply saying that when we talk about engaged learning, that's the thing I think high school teachers really have cornered the market on. You know, because you have to know, I think, because of your clientele, how to, most of you who are experts, um, know how to engage the students, and that is great. And I think oftentimes what college professors can do really well is some of that deep learning, connecting the dots really well in their lectures, but they can't always engage the students enough to help them make use of it. I think we all could benefit by really thinking about the social situatedness of learning and to the extent that we don't just do simulations but we get involved in the real world practice of helping uh, learners really put their learning to use and helping others. It can be transformative and one of the reasons is, is it increases their autonomy, their meaning making and their purpose and that is really powerful. So I think I'll just end there. Um, I just encourage us all to think about the relationship between formal and informal learning and that it's a two-way street for researchers. But so much of this research seems obvious. And that's why I like to bring in the lecture on YouTube because yes, it's obvious. We all know we learn better when it's engaging and yet even in the very best of learning environments at well-known colleges and universities, we aren't always making use of it to the max. Sometimes we can't because of the quantity of students. And we really also, I think the provocative thing here is, and we started on this point, what a huge difference there is if you think of that picture of a high school classroom and often, not here necessarily at Clark, but many of your students will be going on to large public universities. What a huge difference that is when you move from a classroom like your own that might be for 45 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes to a large lecture hall of 600 students, sometimes taking place in two rooms, sometimes by video conference. Um, that's quite a difference and we need all of us to be thinking about that. I, I think that's something we all need to be thinking about in teaching of psychology and it would be fun to think of ways, tops, and the teaching of psychology group at APA could think about that with some of us. So let me just end here. I know we started five, ten minutes late, so I think we can open it up for a discussion if anybody wants to. I think that lots of time. Thank you for being a listening audience.